Hello and welcome to chapter number one, which looks at the nature of business organisations. Now, most organisations will have certain things in common. They will be a collection of people within our organisation and in other resources available that are all working towards a common goal or a common objective. For this to happen, we need to have an element of control over what everyone is doing and how they are doing it. This control comes about from having internal policies and procedures. The implementation of these policies and procedures will be monitored and controlled by internal control processes such as budgets and performance evaluation techniques. For these controls to operate, we need to have a system of recording what's actually happened. This is the accounting system. This paper focuses in on the internal requirement that managers have for information to allow them to make good quality decisions for the organisation. Before we start moving on into that, let's take a look at what an organisation actually is in a little bit more detail. Now, an organisation can be described in various different ways from various different perspectives. We can see it as a social arrangement to start with. This shows how the organisation does not simply have profit making as its only objective. The social arrangement will allow for the development of skills and abilities as individuals interact with each other. This is especially true if areas of the organization are seen as, as specializing in certain areas such as tax or accounting. Organizations can be seen as a set of collective goals. Some of these goals may be profit related, but it will depend upon the type of organization that we have and its selected strategy, whether we do want to go just for profit or whether there are other collective goals that we have instead. Control performance, well, the control of performance will come from managers making decisions and it's this area that the management accounting papers will tend to focus on. As you go through the different parts of these different management accounting papers, always remember that we want our managers to be able to make good quality decisions. One of the things that will allow for good quality decisions is good communication within the organisation. So our organisational structure has to ensure good communication. It has to ensure communication of these collective goals. And then once we know what the goals are, we then need to ensure that everybody understands the level of authority that they have so they can determine what type of decisions are within their realm of authority or not. And then also which ones fall outside of their authority. The actual structure of the organization will be determined based on how we will communicate within the organization and how this span of control is actually detailed. That span of control is something which is really important to us. And we'll come to that in a little bit more detail within the accountant in business paper a little bit later on within your studies. From an organizational perspective, there are various different ways that we can create pieces of information and encourage communication. All of these things listed down here are various different ways of creating additional pieces of communication, which allows for information to be provided to lots of different members of our organization. The structure of the organization will have a huge impact in here as well because the structure of the organization will determine levels of control and authority it will determine your span of authority, your span of control, and it will allow you to work out who reports to you and who you report to. The type of structure that we've got up at the moment is a very, very simple structure, but it's a very, very common structure. This type of hierarchical structure will allow the manager of each different specialist area to control their own areas and then also report back up to more senior management. Now, within this type of organization, we would also have an office. Now, the office itself has got several key functions, but the way to view an office from a simple perspective is simply a place that receives information, processes that information, which changes its format, changes its form to some extent, and then passes that on to somebody else. So when we get the information in, that's the first thing we have to do. We have to actually receive that information in. Once we've received it, we need to understand it to a level and then also understand how we need to process it to make it useful to other people. And then we also need to store it because other parties may want to use it later on in time. 
once we've then stored it, once we've understood exactly what it is and how people will use it, then we have to think about the provision. The provision comes about through our provision of information to other users, which can include various different communication methods. Now, within an office, they can have various different physical layouts. Now, remember, the key objective behind this course is for you to pass an exam. So every single time we come across three different things, that's got potential to be a multi-choice question. That we have got three key types of physical layouts of offices that you need to have an awareness of. And each of them have got their own advantages and disadvantages. You can have an open plan office layout. And with an open plan, it means that there are no walls. There are just several desks in a large room. Everybody can communicate with each other, which is a really good thing. The bad thing is it's very easy to be interrupted by other people. And it's very easy to be disturbed while you're trying to do some other elements of work. From a landscape perspective, this is the development of an open plan, which is had an element of noise reduction added in and we can have noise reduction features in here such as various different partitions imposed you can have various different areas where certain things are going to be very quiet you can have other areas which are going to be more noisy we then have a much older fashioned layout of an office which is a corridor which tends to have lots of smaller offices this is good because it means that it can be quiet which means you can get on with your work it can be bad because it detracts from the element of communication. So the landscaped office sort of comes in between an open plan and a corridor. So there are good and bad things about all of these. You need to have a basic understanding of all of those, I'm afraid, guys. Now, the functions of our office will include things such as purchasing transactions, sales transactions, storage of information around these things, an element of control to make sure certain things happen in a certain way, processing that information, then providing that information to other people as well, which will be our presentation. And it has to be presented in such a way that the users of this information will understand exactly what we've done with the information and they'll understand how to make the best quality decision from it. Now, within an organisation itself, so we're moving back to the bigger picture. Within an organisation, decisions are made at different parts within the organization. If we have a top level focused organization, that is much more centralized. So if we have a top level, much more focused organization on the, the central management hub, we would call that a centralized system. If you have much lower levels of decision making, we would call that a decentralized organizational structure. So centralized means that all the decisions are made in one place. One place. Decentralized means that all the decisions are made wherever they happen to be need to be made at much lower level management grades. Now, there are some good and bad things about centralization and decentralization of organizations. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on centralization. Any advantage of centralization generally becomes a disadvantage for decentralization and vice versa. So we can just go through one set of advantages and disadvantages and then the opposite will be true for the other structure, for the decentralized structure. Centralization has certain key policy advantages because everything is done exactly the same way. So everybody understands what needs to be done. These types of policies and procedures manuals will be readily available to everybody and everybody will understand that the entire organization has got to follow these policies and procedures. This now allows central management, so this will allow central management to have better control over how resources are being used and it can then potentially avoid wasteful competition within our organisation and it can also avoid conflict within the organisation. Because we now have everything controlled from one place, it means that every single transaction which is the same can now be focused in on one area. That now means that we have economies of scale. The idea being that if you do something once, it may take you a large period of time to do it. If you do it a hundred times, you now become better at it. That means it's quicker, you're more efficient. That's the economy of scale, which means that your cost in terms of time and resources being consumed to make every unit will now diminish. That's how we can potentially generate competitive advantage. You can also generate administrative cost savings 
because you only need to have one admin center and that one admin center will look after absolutely everything within the organization. That said, centralization also has some key disadvantages as well. And some of these disadvantages can include things such as extended lines of communication means that the whole idea of me passing a message from the central hub to the person who has to implement that decision actually on a day to day basis, you may now find that the message you get is not the one I originally sent. Or you may find you just understand it in a different way. It also means that there are slower response times because decisions have to pass through various different management grades before they come back to the person who actually has to implement that decision. It also means that local staff be may become demotivated because they've now got less power over what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. That can be a real issue. And you also tend to find that the person making the decision doesn't necessarily understand what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, including not necessarily knowing exactly what the customer wants. And that also means that you may find that you don't understand exactly what resources you have available and you may end up overlooking key employees or potentially just overloading them with so much to do that they can't cope with it. So you may not be able to highlight really important, good quality resources and then you may also find that they're just completely swamped. Now, procedures manual is the most common way of documenting internal control policies and internal control procedures. Use of policies and procedures will generate various different benefits, including things such as the employees will understand their rights, their duties, their responsibilities, so they'll understand exactly what they're ex expected to perform. It can assist in training employees to do things the right way, because we know what we need to do as an employee if we can't do it, there's a training gap which can now be fulfilled by the business and the business will get some benefits from that. It ensures that the same activity is always performed in exactly the same way, regardless of who within the organisation is performing this activity. It can ensure that the employer meets any type of legal duties and responsibilities with regard to things such as health and safety. And it can also ensure that activities are performed as efficiently as possible. That's the idea of the economies of scale and also effectively as possible. Effective production processes will mean that the stuff that we produce will be good, high quality products. Now within our MA1 syllabus, we need to have an understanding, a basic understanding of certain types of transactions. These five key sets of transactions are things where we must have a system of control over. So we must have a system of control over the key transactions within an organization, which are these five key transactions. The way or one of the ways that we can exercise an element of control over these different types of transactions is through the financial accounting system. Now, the financial accounting system is only part of the internal control system. The financial accounting system will record transactions within usually a computerized accounting system and this system will produce a set of financial statements, which will be the financial accounts. They also produce management information as well. This management information is something which we will focus much more heavily on within this paper. And it's that type of information which will allow managers to make a good quality decision. What we do within the next chapter, within chapter number two, is look at the key differences between financial accounting and management accounting. And there are some significant differences in there. Now, when we're starting to look at the financial accounting system, we always need to take into account the books of prime entry. Now, these books of prime entry should be thought of as the books of first entry. And these entries into the books of prime entry will be collated together and then posted into the financial accounting system. They will also be used within the management accounting system. So the total figures from these books of first entry or books of prime entry will get posted into the financial accounting system and the management accounting system. The total from each of these books of prime entry will be posted through to different ledger accounts. So the different books of prime entry will then be posted through to various different ledger accounts. So as a, for instance, the sales day book will be posted through to receivables ledgers because they're sales on credit. The purchases day book, which are purchases on credit, get posted through to the payables ledger. 
Now, from a cost accounting perspective, what we're looking at is the collection of cost and revenue data. We're interested in the full production process. So all of the information from these books of prime entry, which are being processed across my accounting system, all of these things will be of interest to me. We still have debits and credits to post within the cost accounting system, but they are viewed differently from the financial accounting system. So the cost accounting debits and credits will still work in the same way as from a financial accounting perspective, but we just look at them from a different perspective. Debits are seen as inputs into a process. So debits are seen as inputs into a process, whereas credits are seen as outputs from a process. The T account itself can be seen as the process. So debits are inputs, credits become outputs. Note that the output from one process, which is a credit from one process, may then become the input or the debit into another process. So the output from one process, which will be a credit from process number one, may become the input into process number two. So I credit process one, debit process number two. What this now means is we can view the organisation as a series of processes or from a cost accounting perspective as T accounts where we go from start to finish. If you look at example or section 11 within your notes, you'll see there's an example of how this potentially works. And this example looks at goods arriving into the stores control account as the debit. So debiting to the stores control account, that's us as an organization buying some raw materials and that's it going into the stores so we can actually hold it within stores. So debit to stores shows an input into the stores process. The cost ledger, ledger control account shows that there's an amount of expense which is had to be paid for. Then what we have in the second part of the transaction, when we credit the store's control account, shows the raw materials coming out of the store's control account and actually going into the production process. So debit work in progress shows the assets being transferred from stores into production. Now, most of our accounting systems will be computerized accounting systems. And there are several benefits as to why we should have computerized accounting systems rather than anything else. Some of the key benefits that you need to have an, interesting, an interest in within this paper will include things such as information access. Information is important to me because I will base my decisions on information. And I need to ensure that the information that we're using is accurate, it is relevant, it is reliable, it is understandable. That will then allow for a good quality decision. We will look at that in much more detail later on within your studies here. Also, planning activities and then controlling activities. This is how I implement decisions. So I need to make a decision. Once I've made that decision, I then need to implement it. Implementing a decision means planning for it, making it happen, and then making sure it's happening in exactly the way I thought it should happen. So there's my planning and controlling activities, which fits in really nicely with my decision-making activities. Hopefully this has given you a good basic understanding of what an organisation is and this is the foundation from which we will drive forward throughout the rest of this paper. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I'll see you on chapter number two.